Yosemite, grandest of all the special temples of nature I was ever permitted to enter. Those words were written by John Muir, devotee and conservationist of Yosemite National Park. They're a hymn to Yosemite's very special beauty. One of the jewels in Yosemite's crown is Tenaya Lake. Tenaya lies to the west of Tuolumne Meadows, portal to the backcountry. Climbers love this area. A climb on stately Pleasure Dome, which rises above the banks of Tenaya Lake, helps accustom the climber to Yosemite's unique granite and offers spectacular views. Domes of granite dominate the landscape. These domes were carved by the passing glaciers thousands of years ago. The highest dome, Fairview, is 900 feet high. Moving glaciers scour the bedrock to a high sheen called glacier polish. Larger rocks called erratics can be seen, deposited randomly by the receding glacier. The smaller rocks often left grooves or gouges in the granite, marking their passage. These marks point in the direction of glacial movement. Small streams and lakes from the back country begin to converge in Tuolumne Meadows. The stream which caresses the meadows so gently soon begins to dance, leaping and cascading in flashes of sunlight. Finally, it's gone, plunging into some of the most eloquent expressions of water, the waterfalls of the valley. Nevada Falls plunges 594 feet into cascades leading to Vernal Falls. Vernal, 317 feet high, is one of the most accessible falls to hikers. King of the Falls, and the third longest in the world, is Yosemite Falls. It plunges 2,565 feet to the valley floor. The valley is the heart of the National Park. 
The Merced River winds through the length of the valley and is a mirror of solitude. Glacier Point, near the eastern edge of the valley, is a face-climbing playground for climbers. However, the northwest face of Half Dome facing Glacier Point is a serious goal for many big wall climbers. Half Dome, sheared in half by retreating glaciers, is one of the most prominent features of the valley. make their home in the park. Mule deer can often be seen in the early morning or late afternoon foraging for food. The coyote usually hunts alone, scavenging for rodents, grasshoppers, birds, berries, carrion, and sometimes injured deer. One can often hear the eerie singing of the coyote at dawn or dusk. The largest Sierra carnivore is the intelligent black bear. Due to the carelessness of campers, this fat black bear has found that the best food opportunities are in the campgrounds. Unfortunately, human food is extremely unhealthy for the bear. He must be tagged on the ear for future identification and removed to a remote area of the park. The granite of Yosemite Valley was sculpted by glaciers. Majestic El Capitan, near the western end of the valley, is the tallest unbroken cliff in the world, standing a breathtaking 3,000 feet high. El Capitan, meaning the chief, is the great symbol of Yosemite for climbers. Uncountable routes lead up the sheer face to the top. Merced River winds from the valley into Merced Canyon. Here are many famous cliffs for free climbing like Reed's Pinnacle. The most famous are the Cookie Cliffs, a free climber's mecca. Here are many super cracks. The most famous are Outer Limits, Crack a Go Go, the classic Waverly Wafer, Wheat Thin, Butterfingers, and Butterballs all on the great Nabisco wall. Today, Johnny Woodward and Hermann Wing want to climb several classics on the Nabisco wall. These climbs are rated from 510 to 511. They require many free climbing techniques and good equipment. I think I'm going to leave my stuff here. The water got too hot yesterday. Yeah. Hermann Wing from Mexico City is one of the strongest climbers on the scene. He produces handmade climbing shoes in his own shop in Mexico. They're special soft rubber soled shoes that adhere easily to the rock. Hermann visits Yosemite almost every year. His incredible strength is due to rigorous daily training and climbing. Johnny Woodward comes from Great Britain. He may be skinny, but he's also incredibly strong. His strength derives more from technique than from training. During the past few years, Johnny has visited annually all the major climbing areas in the States. He's made climbing trips to Joshua Trees in Southern California, Smith Rocks in Oregon, and Boulder Canyon in Colorado. Johnny likes the American climbing areas better than those in Great Britain, mostly because of the nasty English weather. Only the essential equipment is carried, carabiners, nuts and friends are attached to the leader's seat belt. These will only be used for protection, not for climbing. The climber is connected to the rope with a figure eight knot.
The fundamental protection is a belay. The climber is connected to the belay with a clove hitch. Powdered magnesium carried in a chalk bag keeps the climber's fingers dry. It's not fun at all to fall off the rock because of slippery, sweaty hands. The classic climbs that Johnny and Hermann want to do today are enjoyable Beverly's Tower, exposed wheat thin, strenuous butter balls, and unique butter fingers. Johnny will lead the first pitch. A pitch is the distance from belay to belay. Johnny is protected by Hermann. A thin ledge leads to the bolt belay on the Bisco wall. As soon as Johnny's anchored on the belay, Hermann can follow. Beverly's tower is mostly a steep dihedral rated 510. It's always an incredible pleasure to climb a steep vertical sun-warmed rock without the use of much power. Instead, good climbing techniques enable the climber to move fluently up the sheer face. The dihedrals are climbed by laybacking, stretching, or stemming. An exposed traverse leads to the center of the Nabisco wall. The next climb is Wheat Thin, a vertical crack climb rated 510C. It's a breathtaking layback flake leading skywards, requiring a little more power than Beverly's Tower. Now it's Hermann's turn to lead.
Armand places a small nut next to the three volt belay to ensure his safety. He ties his seat belt to the three bolts with a sling. Then he connects himself to the bolts and nut with his rope. The bolts and sling are fixed permanently to the rock. Once Hermann is anchored securely to the belay, he's able to protect Johnny well. The next climb is the challenging finger crack butter balls. Butter balls runs parallel to wheat thin and begins at the same belay. Therefore, Johnny and Herman must now rappel down the cliff. Rappelling is descending on the rope. It's only used when there is no other means of descent. Herman ensures that he has all of the gear and rappels down the doubled up rope. Once at the bottom, he can pull on one end and retrieve the rope. The slings and the bolts are permanent. They were placed there by the climber who made the very first ascent of the route. Butter balls is an extremely strenuous finger crack climb rated 511C. A finger crack means that there are almost no substantial handholds. The climber must rely solely on jammed fingertips and feet. The crack doesn't have permanent bolts or petons for protection. Therefore, the climber must place the protection himself as he climbs, which is much more difficult.
The next pitch, Butterfingers, is also a very difficult finger crack climb rated 511A. However, unlike butter bowls, there's only one hard move. After the crux, the crack opens up into a friendly hand jam leading to the top of Cookie Cliffs. Yosemite Valley is very colorful in autumn. The days are shorter and the temperature is much more agreeable than in summer. The trees, clear creeks and green meadows create a unique landscape. Fewer visitors are in the park and all is calm and quiet after the summer rush. The beginning of October is the time to enjoy the solitude and peacefulness of the valley. The rush of spring runoff from the high country fills the Merced River. Often the water flows over the banks and onto the meadows. However, in fall, the Merced is calm and gentle and provides sanctuary for a number of animals. The great blue heron is not often seen. It makes a majestic sight, stalking slowly along the banks of the river. Its long beak enables it to snatch up fish, frogs, and sometimes even a mouse.
It's not always nice weather in Yosemite, especially in fall. The rain in the valley may mean snow higher up. Often the most spectacular scenes occur when the sunlight manages to break through the clouds. The reprieve from the onslaught of winter seems to be only momentary. Overnight, the temperature dropped and the rain turned into snow. Already in the beginning of October, Yosemite begins to don its winter clothes. Finally, the sky is clear, and it looks like Christmas is just around the corner. Yosemite Falls is aglow with tinsel and fire. However, the Sierran weather is varied and often erratic. The temperature rises unexpectedly and the snow begins to melt. The snow remains only in the high country where winter has truly begun. Here, seasonal snow accumulation ranges from 13 to 70 feet. The strong Californian sun gives a special gift to the valley, the golden days of Indian summer. Three million visitors admire Yosemite National Park every year. There are many campgrounds providing facilities for these visitors. One of these, Sunnyside Campground, is home for the climbers. Climbers arrive here by any and all means. Some would even go as far as to call Sunnyside's parking lot a junkyard. But here the climbers are truly in their element. The lifestyle of climbers requires many skills some not connected to climbing. A knowledge of car mechanics is often handy. Cheap tools and bad parts are a constant challenge to the climber's mechanical techniques. But after all, it's worth it when one's motorhome can be called home sweet home. Much of the climbing scene takes place in the parking lot. The local residents enjoy wheeling and dealing for climbing gear. Advertisements for gear and rides are located conveniently on the camp's bulletin board. 
Sunnyside is called Camp 4 in climbing circles. It's the cheapest and dustiest of all of Yosemite's campgrounds. That's why the climbers stay here. Climbers from all over the world pilgrimage every year to Yosemite. This creates a unique international ambiance in the camp. One point in common that all climbers share is their need for an orderly camp. The park rangers know how to appreciate this. Climbers exercise their ingenuity in setting up a proper camp. Needless to say, Camp 4 enjoys a worldwide reputation among climbing circles. All over Camp 4 are granite boulders. Climbers practice a special sport on these called bouldering. Bouldering entails several difficult moves without ropes. Most of the moves are so difficult that it often takes many attempts. Sometimes it takes up to a year to climb a boulder. This boulder isn't steep at all, but the handholds and footholds are extremely small. The difficulty of a climb is more dependent on the amount and size of the handholds and footholds than on steepness. Small handholds require great finger strength and confident footwork. A good climbing shoe is essential. The soles of climbing shoes are made from specially soft rubber to assure good adhesion to the rock. It's much more agreeable to climb on clean handholds. There's no handhold too high for Hermann's special toothbrush. The climbing problem posed by this boulder is to reach the first handhold and to get over the edge. Although this boulder is overhanging, the handholds are bigger than on the last boulder Hermann climbed. Therefore, this is an easier climb. Climbs are graded by a special rating system. The easiest climbs are 5-1, and the most difficult are 5-13. There are not too many climbers who can climb a 5-13. This overhanging boulder is called backer crack. It's not only overhanging, but the hand and footholds are small and widely spaced. Therefore, it's rated 512C. There are not even handholds on the crux. Hermann must hang his entire weight on only three wedged fingertips. The feet are also jammed in the crack, but don't relieve the fingers at all, serving only to stabilize the body. Bouldering is a natural form of gymnastics. It requires much agility and strength. It's hard to imagine how much power it really takes because Hermann makes it look pretty easy. However, Hermann devotes much time to training. <laughs> Climbers should have strong back muscles, but the most important are arm and finger strength. Finger strength is trained best by hanging from a small ledge.
Herman's hardest exercise is one-arm pull-ups, hanging just on his fingertips. An average climber cannot even hang on one arm on his fingertips, let alone do pull-ups. Some residents prefer the relaxed lifestyle in Camp 4 to rigorous training. The climbers on Site 20 enjoy a leisurely breakfast every day. Unfortunately, nobody remembered the pancake today. However, these Camp 4 residents know how to improve the taste. Minute Maid lemon powder is always utilized when the situation looks hopeless. A new day of climbing is now ready to begin. Today, Johnny and Herman have planned a very ambitious itinerary. Their first climb will be Tales of Power, located above the Cookie Cliffs in Merced Canyon. It's a classic overhanging 512B hand crack. The hand crack is a nasty size, only one and a quarter inches wide. Therefore, it's easier for those with smaller hands. The distance from bottom to top is 90 feet. The overhang extends 20 feet. The route begins with a mean chimney tapering off into an off-wit. Tales of Power is one of the most challenging climbs in the park.
The reward for conquering the crux is another chimney. This one is even nastier than the first, since by this time the climber is starting to lose his strength. But soon Hermann will be able to recover at the Vile while Johnny follows. A short rest is needed after climbing Tales of Power, especially since the next climb is also not just a mere height. Now it's Johnny's turn to lead. He will attempt the next pitch, the spectacular route called Separate Reality. The route is rated 511D and is only 40 feet long. The first 20 feet are vertical and are not too difficult. However, the following 20 feet are hard and horizontal. 